the book of Zechariah during camp. Then on then on we had our last Sunday Resurrection Sunday service, where we focused on the Luke Luke's account of the resurrection of Christ. So let's we go back to our study since the beginning of the year on Genesis one through eleven. Primarily, we pointed out from the very beginning that these are biblical foundations, foundational teachings, passages that give us the foundation for other Old Testament passages as well as the New Testament doctrine, even of the gospel. So the gospel itself is rooted on these first, ten, first 11 chapters of Genesis. And therefore it's so important that we understand its message uh, because it is foundational to our belief system. If we want to build high a building, we have to dig low. So it is in the Christian life. We want to grow in our faith, then we have to be deeply anchored on the foundations of the Word of God. <clears throat> so I trust that you are benefiting from our study as it has been a refresher for me to go through these passages. We are now in Genesis chapter 9. This is a post-Diluvian uh, scenario after the flood. And the question is, did the post-Diluvian successors do any better? We're looking at Gen Genesis 9 verses 18 down through 29 and to give god honor and due reverence shall we stand please as we read this portion of scripture responsively bear in mind that this is after the flood and the sons of noah that went forth of the ark were shem and ham and japheth and ham is the father of canaan And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood. 350 years, 29. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Father in heaven, we come humbly before thee. Thank you for these opening chapters of the Bible. They surely lay down for us the beginnings of human history, the beginning of creation, the beginning of man, the beginning of the family, the beginning of sin, the beginning of uh, redemption, the beginning of uh, Israel, and so on and so forth. So thank you for these portions of scripture. You did not leave us in the dark roping through a trial and error method and trying to figure out where we came from, what is our purpose, and what is our destiny. So speak to our hearts afresh. Equip your saints with the work of the ministry and of your word so that we can uh, articulate these truths to friends and loved ones who also need to know the gospel and how they can get right with you through the marriage of Jesus Christ. So thus we ask, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We shall thank you for it. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> We're looking at the oracle of Noah the cur and the curse of Canaan. Okay? We're looking at Genesis 9. And from the very beginning of the year, 2024, which is amazing, we are already in April. We are entering the second quarter of the year or the end of the first trimester time is flying so fast <clears throat> but uh, it's un to me it's encouraging and refreshing for me to go through these chapters the opening verses of scripture to help us understand like we mentioned it answers questions like where did we come from why are we here and where are we headed what is our destiny very basic life's basic questions that need answers, and they need to be definite answers that come not from the fallible opinions of men, but the infallible truths of the Word of God. We find them here in these first 11 chapters. 
where the scenario of the Holy Spirit gives us what's going on all, all around the world from the beginning of time and the beginning of creation to the fall and so on and so forth. <clears throat> While there are people, critics, liberals, rationalists who question the authenticity of the record, we already put those arguments to silence by citing no less than the Lord Jesus Christ's basis for believing its historicity and, and authenticity. No less than Christ himself, the eternal Son of God, in Matthew 19, verse 4, mentioned to his critics of his day, Have you not read that, that they which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus Christ, in the midst of his controversies, appealed to his final court of appeal, which is the word of God. And in that particular instance, in Matthew 19, he was appealing to the portion of scripture called in the book of Genesis, affirming the creation account, the historicity of Adam and Eve, because how in the world would, why would Christ appeal to those passages if he did not believe them to be accurate and historical and authentic? So we don't have to appeal to any human brilliant scholar. We have, we have enough um, uh, authority from the lips of Christ himself to believe the historicity and authenticity of the Genesis record. From the creation of all things, out from nothing, God spake and it was so ex nihilo. Without pre-existing material, God created the world in six little 24-hour solar days. So we have in chapter 1 the chronological account of creation. In chapter 2 we have the anthropological account of creation. Chapter 1 is cosmologic. How did all the world begin? In chapter 2 is anthropologic. It focuses on the sixth day when God created Adam and Eve and all the details were given to us by, the, by Moses as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Adam and Eve placed in the utopia, in the Garden of Eden, where all of their needs were provided for. <clears throat> Yet God placed them in a probationary period. He wanted to test them, and therefore He did not create them robots to simply obey Him. They want, he wanted them to exercise their volition. They were created free agents, as we all are, to, so that He would test our loyalties to Him, and sadly, in that test, they failed. We know from Genesis chapter 3, the record of the fall of man. Not only were the consequences of their sin devastating to them, it affected the entire of God's created order. The human race and all of creation has been placed under the divine curse. We see that in chapter 3. Okay? Since then, then the, the serpent would crawl on the ground. The woman would be bearing child with pain as they would give birth. Man will have to labor, and that was already his responsibility prior to the fall. But this time he had to, he had to sweat it out before the fruit of the vine would come out to meet their needs. All part of a fallen world. And that explains why we are living in the kind of world in which we live. Death, disease, uh, decay are all part of a fallen world in which we live. All that we can do is try to alleviate ourselves from the results of the curse. But we cannot avoid the curse nonetheless. That's exactly what um, Cain tried to do. He tried to create a civilization <coughs> in defiance of God. And while his efforts to approve the quality of life on earth did help everybody, including believers, the godly line of uh, Abel and Seth, nonetheless, he did it in rebellion against God. So in both instances, in, in Genesis chapter 3 and Genesis 4, we find already the beginnings of how sinners were to get right with God. It was through a substitutionary sacrifice. God will not accept any man-made sacrifice for sin. God will have to be the one to provide the sacrifice. Salvation is of the Lord. It has to be death by an innocent substitute, and it has to be by the shedding of blood. This has been established from the very beginning. Written in the book of Genesis is to be read by the Jews. This is part of the Torah, Genesis 1 through 5, the Pentateuch so that the Jews will be familiar with how God dealt with sinners way back then, how to get right with God. It was included in the canon so that even the church today would learn how things began, how since man fell into sin, how would they get right with God? It was through a substitutionary sacrifice, which all pictured or typified the coming Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
So while Adam, after Adam and Eve's fall, eventually life moved on in a fallen world. Chapter 4 and chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a record of the genealogy where we are constantly reminded that of the effects of the fall. The lineage of Adam down the line, and in every case it says, and they died. Except in one instance. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Okay. The only record in Genesis 5, during those days when somebody did not taste physical death. The New Testament predicts that also. Enoch was a type of the New Testament church saints who will not taste death. Maybe you and I will be part of that generation. I, am, I believe that to be the case, although I cannot be dogmatic because we don't know the exact time of the Lord's return for the rapture. But in other words, we already have a precedent of sinners who did not taste death in the person of Enoch. And then we have the son, his son, Enos, and down the line to uh, the godly line of Enoch and Enos, which is Noah. Despite uh, escaping, uh, despite the fall, you would think that man would have learned their lessons. But history has a tendency to repeat itself, doesn't it? As the saying goes, if there is one thing we can learn from history, is that we never learn from history. So despite the fall in the Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 6 tells us that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and the imaginations of their heart was only evil. It doesn't say sometimes or occasionally. It says continually. So God had to judge the world with a worldwide deluge, a worldwide flood. To this day, we've, we, there have been archaeologists who have figured out, the, tried to trace the location of that ark, Noah's ark, and they have found it. Somewhere in the boundaries of, uh, of Russia, Mount Ararat, exactly where Genesis tells us, they have found the, the, uh, the ark, at least the, some of the structures of the ark there, only reaffirming the Genesis record. We are now in chapter 9. We've seen chapter 6, 7, 8, and beginnings of chapter 9. When after God judging the whole world with a worldwide flood. So that there were only eight souls who got saved. Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. Nobody else got saved. All, of, all that had breath had to die, including all animals except those who were in the ark. And it is a call for all believers, all people today also, if they want to be spared of coming judgment, there's only one place, and that's in the ark of safety, who is in a person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not trusted in Christ as your Savior, you will die in your sins. We're now looking at chapter 9. We've seen in the beginning verses of chapter 9 the Noahic Covenant. After the flood, God placed himself into a covenant with Noah, and there he authorized the death penalty. Okay, anybody, if you wonder, since there was a worldwide destruction of human life and earthly life, everything that had breath, eventually God emphasizes the importance of life because anyone who commit the sin or the heinous crime of murder was authorized by the human government to execute the death penalty. The Bible does teach capital punishment. It is all over the Old Testament. It's also indicated in the New Testament. Sadly, many cultures today and countries have departed from that biblical design for the sake of what? Humanism. He gets a lahat tao. What will make life more comfortable for man without any regard for God and his divine oracles? We come to the second part of Genesis chapter 9, and here we have again how painfully honest the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit tells it like it is. We have a hero of the faith, Noah, instrumental in making a stand in the midst of the worldwide flood, falls in drunkenness with the Noahic covenant in place. The focus turns properly toward what will become of the survivors of the flood and of their descendants or their progeny. Did they, these post-Diluvian successors, fare better? 
We already mentioned history has the tendency to repeat itself. So after the worldwide flood, you would think just like after the, 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 the fall of man in Genesis 3, man would have learned his lesson. Here we have after the worldwide flood, again, people do not learn their lesson. Again, we find no less than Noah himself showing his weaknesses. So in chapter 9, notice verse 18 and 19. It says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. These were the sons of Noah. And Ham is the father of Canaan. That phrase is often repeated in this chapter. Why? Because the Jews who will read that and say, Ham is the father of Canaan. Because remember in the Old Testament, the Canaanites, these are the ancestors or descendants of Ham. The Canaanites were the people whom God instructed that used to drive away in the land flowing with milk and honey. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Canaanites were to be driven away because of their lawlessness and their wickedness. So Moses introduces uh, the Canaanites here that Ham was their father. Verse 19, and there these are the three sons of Noah and of them was the whole earth overspread. These verses bring to an end the flood account. <clears throat> and they, pre they prepare the way for chapter 10, which is the table of nations. We'll be touching that next week. In other words, all of humanity not only came from Adam, all of humanity came from Noah's descendants, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we will see in chapter 10 next week how we belong to the descendants of Ham. The Jews came from the descendants of Shem. The Japheth, Japheth migrated towards north as we will see in chapter 10. That's where the Russians and other people of the north came from. <clears throat> but we will talk more about that next week. There are key lessons that we will find. In other words, these 18 and 19 are introductions. They can serve as an introduction to chapter 10, verse 1. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Okay, so you want to trace your genealogy. We are given an inspired record of where we actually came from. Three main points in our message this morning. Point number one, if you have your your notes with you. Response to decadence must be ethical, must be with ethical purity and not moral abandonment. That's lesson number one. Response to decadence, decadence or the proper response to wrong living must be with ethical purity. We cannot do two things never make a right. If somebody's wrong then we don't, that's not an excuse for us to live wrongly. We have to respond with ethical purity, not moral abandonment. Point number two, <clears throat> God will bless the righteous but curse those who act with moral abandonment. It was so then, it's still true today. And lastly, we will see in the last verse that the, re the realities of a fallen world remain even during the post-Diluvian era. Okay. Like I said, you would think man would have learned his lesson after worldwide catastrophe like a global flood. But nonetheless, the realities of a fallen world remain the same. It's a new world. No more the wicked people. And yet we see wickedness again surfacing. Why? Because man is still in his fallen state. Let's go through it one at a time and flesh this all out. First, response to decadence must be with ethical purity and not moral abandonment. We see that in verses 20 to 23. And Noah began to be a husbandman. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, again notice that phrase, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Okay, let me pause there. So notice the decadent behavior of Noah. Again, like we said, this is where the Holy Spirit is painfully honest. Rightly did what somebody said, the Bible is a book that man would not write if he could and could not write if he would. Because if you were to write your own autobiography or you would ask somebody to write your autobiography, you would prefer that they will not uh, spell out your flaws and fallibilities. 
But the Holy Spirit tells it like it is. Even among its heroes, the heroes of the faith have their flaws, have their fallibilities, just like we all have it. And that's exactly what, his, what we have here as a record of Noah's, um, towards the end of his life, we, he showed some kind of decadent behavior. This was the post-flood scenario. And as you read uh, the, the last three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, after the flood, just before the entering of Abraham and introduction of the nation of Israel. The post-flood beginnings are mentioned in these chapters, which are not good. Like what? First, we have here Noah's planting a vineyard. Second, in chapter 10, Nimrod becoming a hunter. We will mention about that next week. And then chapter 11, the tower of, of the Tower of Babel that was built by the people of Shinar. These were things that happened. These were things that were began after chapter 10 or chapter 9. And unfortunately, they were not all good. Again, I say history has a tendency to repeat itself. That is why we should never look to man. We have people in our Christian lives that we respect and highly respect and honor. But remember, all of our human, all heroes of the faith are fallible men. We are exhorted in Scripture to look unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. When people we respect, fallible as we all are, stumble and fumble and fall, then we don't have to fall as well. Why? Because if our faith is anchored on the only one who is the only one true God, then we don't have to falter ourselves. Now, what was Noah's error? What was his offense? What did he do wrong in Genesis chapter 9? Well, we are told in verse 21, and he drank, so he 20, he, he became a husbandman and he planted a vineyard. There's nothing wrong in scripture here that well, there was something wrong in planting a vineyard. Nothing in scripture to condemn that. But verse 21, he drank of the wine and was drunken and he was uncovered within his tent. What was Noah's offense? We need to learn from this. His excess led to his immodesty. And it was the reason for the shame by itself. There, were two, there are two degrading effects of excessive wine. Something that needs to be talked about even today. Two degrading effects of excessive wine. Number one is drunkenness. Second is nakedness. Drunkenness and nakedness. The prophetic oracles use nakedness and drunkenness in their descriptions of a chaotic of chaotic tragedies. Turn with me to the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 while your fingers in Genesis chapter 9. And the other oracles or prophecies of these prophets. Habakkuk chapter 2. What does Habakkuk predict or uh, say with regard to the drunkenness of the Babylonians? Okay, Habakkuk chapter 2. Notice what it says in verse 15. He was giving the woes against the Babylonians. Chapter 2, verse 15. Woe unto him, and he's referring to the Babylonians here, that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Not a favorable statement for drunkenness. In fact, it has a strong woe against those who give his neighbor drink. It is bad enough to be drunk with wine wherein is excess or debauchery. But here it even condemns giving to his neighbor drink. Woe to him. This is exactly what the Babylonians were guilty of. And isn't that what many are guilty of today? We can dwell on this point because of the prevalence of drunkenness and wine drinking in our day. But this is what the Bible says. Turn to the book of Lamentations. So you know, it's the last time you read the book of Lamentations. Lamentations were written by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was lamenting or weeping because of the fall of, Bab of, uh, of Jerusalem and, and Judah. 
under the hands of the Babylonians. He saw the sacred holy city of Jerusalem fall into the hands of Gentile world powers and turn into Jer Lamentations chapter 4 and in verse 21. Rejoice and be glad, says Jeremiah, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shall make thyself naked again we find here comments or statements prophetic oracles that use nakedness and drunkenness together to describe chaotic tragedies is it not sir this is not therefore surprising why you know when people want to loosen their standards or restraints they give in they give in to wine and drunkenness and which eventually leads to nakedness as well. The point is simply clear here. In fact, one of the reasons why Moses, uh, some scholars added, added that the reason why Moses adds this narrative, not only because they are true, they point here some form of a polemic or a defense against pagan ideas and practices. What do we mean by that? In the ancient Near East, the ancient Near East saw Armenia, the original home of wine. See, some people are so intoxicated by wine that they, 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 uh, they love it so much. It is their, uh, it is their body, so to speak. So, in the nation Near East, they saw Armenia as the original home of wine. But Egyptian literature attributed its inv in invention to whom? To the god Osiris. Greek literature attributed to Dionysius, another god. For some, having a bottle of wine and drinking it is simply like heaven. It is their way of going out of the monotony of life so that they can break off from the monotony of life and get an escape out of it and can get drunk. The Bible, on the other hand, in Ephesians 5.18 tells us, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Word of God offers another alternative to get out of the monotony of life. And it's not to be drunk with wine and be dominated by the flesh. To get out of the monotony of life, you be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 And when you're filled with the Spirit, the participles that follow describe what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Maybe let's turn to Ephesians 5. So we understand what Paul is driving at in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 18. I don't want us to miss this point because this is part of the scripture and this is a relevant material for all of us even today regardless of age. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess or it is debauchery. Don't be drunk with wine or stop being drunk with wine. Some of the Ephesians were already being drunk with wine. And Paul is saying, the Greek construction here is, they were doing it. It's present tense. And Paul is saying, stop it. I don't know how our lifestyle is going. Only God can see us. The pastor is not going to be around. And neither will you see me every time. But the Bible condemns being drunk with wine. This is not the way the Christian if this is not the Christian way to get out of the monotony of life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The main word, be filled, is the present tense. Meaning, keep on being filled with the Spirit. And what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? To be filled with the Spirit means to be controlled by the Spirit. Just when a person is drunk with wine, is controlled by one, by wine, so is the one filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit. And the participles that follow simply describe the main verb of the sentence, which is to be filled. It says, be, uh, be, be filled with the Spirit. And then that's in verse 19. Notice the first participle. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. A person is filled with the Spirit will be speaking to among themselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Will be singing and making melody in their hearts. To whom? To the Lord. When a person is filled with the Spirit, he will sing his hymns and psalms and he will sing it not for performance, not so that people will say, Ang mong kumanta. He will sing it to the Lord. That's what Ephesians 5 18 is saying. That's why the, during our Sunday school class, somebody was asked, What if uh, 
if uh, Taylor Swift sings Amazing Grace or like Elvis Presley sings Amazing Grace doesn't matter are they singing to the Lord just performing and maybe we're us singing in the choir making a special are we singing here to the Lord or are we performing to be filled with the Spirit is to be singing as we go in psalms and hymns and spiritual notice that word spiritual in contrast to carnal songs spiritual songs singing and making melody in our hearts to him when we sing as a person is filled with the spirit our audience is but one and that's god that's what every choir member and special number will do when they sing or play some instrument and what is the next participle it says speaking singing making melody in their hearts to the lord and then it says in the last part in verse 18 and submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of god it says also in verse 20 giving thanks always did you notice that verse 21 is submitting all of these participles describe what it means to be filled with the spirit and did you notice Paul is giving a contrast or comparison between being filled and being controlled by wine. When a person is controlled, there are some similarities or parallels. When a person is drunk, he will keep singing. Just like the person is filled with the Spirit. He will keep speaking just like the person is filled with the Spirit. Okay? Similarities. But the difference is in orientation. The person is filled with the Spirit will sing to the Lord. The person is drunk, well, we keep talking, talking, talking. We'll keep singing, singing, singing. I'm thankful by the grace of God. I have never taken, I've never been drunk all my life, and I don't plan to be to go through that any time. But I've seen people who've been drunk, and I know this is true. They keep singing, and they keep speaking. The difference: he's controlled by wine. The person's filled with the Holy Spirit is controlled by the Holy Spirit. You want to break up the monotony of life? Don't be like Noah in this particular episode. Be filled with the Spirit. Let's go back to the text. Genesis chapter 9. So while Greek literature attributed um, the origin of wine to Dionysius, the god Dionysius, and the Egyptians attributed to the intervention of the god Osiris to them, why it's heaven when we drink wine? In the Genesis record, the origin of wine and its effects. This is the first time we see a person drunk in the Bible. The origin of wine and its effects was anything but divine. It has all the trappings of depravity. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 9. I can dwell with this point, but there's so much material to cover this morning. We're already uh, 12.07 in our time. Notice, not only we have decadent behavior, we have moral abandonment. While it was wrong for Noah to be drunk, sadly his son, Ham, responded in moral abandonment. We see in verse 22 of Genesis 9, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. Okay. What did Ham do which resulted in his descendants being cursed because we read the rest of the chapter Noah cursed Ham and his descendants the Canaanites how serious is his offense what was his offense to begin with the Bible says he saw the nakedness of his father so what does that mean well it is a euphemism you know what a euphemism is right a euphemism is a nice way of saying things it is a euphemism for some sin so what, what does it mean? The Talmud, which is the law book of the Jews, is the compilation, the interpretation of Jews of the Old Testament. The Talmud records that what happened is probably they suspect that castration took place. In other words, maybe Ham castrated his father. And their support is found in Genesis 9.24, which is not really a clear support. It says, Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. What did he do? There's nothing there that suggests castration. And yet the Talmud suggests that. Others suggest 
that being he was remember in verse 23 that he was un, he uncovered the nakedness of his father that's the fault of, of Ham Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness unlike Ham so what does that mean others think that that means Ham engaged in incest with his mother Noah's wife say well that's really more than what the text is saying but that's what some others say in other words that's the reason why Canaan Ham's ancestry was cursed because he, that was the offspring of this incestuous relationship so where do we stand there is very weak evidence to these views the truth is when we read the passage plainly he did nothing other than see his father's nakedness apparently Noah was so drunk so that he had you know removed his shirt or whatever naked and fell on his bed naked and Ham entered that room and saw his father's nakedness that's all it was an act however that was serious enough to prompt the oracle on Ham's descendants it was serious enough in order to curse Ham's descendants why because during that time to be exposed and even today to be exposed meant to be unprotect, unprotected to see someone uncovered or naked was to bring dishonor and to gain the advantage for potential exploitation. Ham's seeing was the disgusting thing. Ham's errant looking, which is a moral flaw, represented the first step in the abandonment of a moral code. It was just the beginning of what led to his sin even, even further. This violation of a boundary destroyed the honor of Noah. We find looking in Scripture as a sin in other portions of Scripture. Do you remember what happened in Genesis 9.26? Very quickly, let's turn there in Genesis 9. What happened to Lot? <clears throat> Genesis 19.26. His wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt okay again going back to chapter 14 <clears throat> notice in chapter 14 and uh, so abraham and lot's people were having some kind of a squabble so abraham said you go left i turn right you go right i turn left okay and it says in chapter uh, 13 rather notice in verse 10 13 verse 10 verse 9 Abraham said it's not the whole land before thee separate thyself I pray thee from me if thou wilt take the left hand I will go to the right if thou wilt depart to the right I will go to the left and Lot what does it say he lifted up his eyes he was living by sight rather than by faith and beheld all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. And therefore, that was the step, the first step, looking. He lifted up his eyes. And then verse 11, he chose all the plain of Jordan and journeyed east eventually and dwelt his tent towards Sodom in, chapter, in that same chapter. See? So, remember that old song that we teach our children? We need to sing this again. So, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Those seductive look could be dangerous. It could be an indication of a fall already. So, the violation of a boundary destroyed the honor of Noah. Not only did he see his father's nakedness, the, the taboos of looking against such looking we find in Genesis 19, Exodus 33, Judges, 1 Samuel 6, remember Matthew chapter 5 says, anyone who looks at a woman with lust has committed adultery. Psalms 101 verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Something that we all need to be resolved in doing as well. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. His go 
And Ham's going to tell his brothers about it without covering the old man aggravated the act. In other words, Ham, it's indicated that he ridiculed the old man's downfall. Yes, Noah was wrong. It was a flaw on his part. He got drunk. But in the ancient world, Ham's actions was not, was not to be overlooked. In the ancient world, insulting, listen to young people, listen here. Insulting one's parents was a serious matter that warranted extreme penalty of death. You see that in the theocracy of Gen Exodus and Deuteronomy. Here in this passage, this narrative illustrates the abrogation of the fifth command. What is the fifth commandment? Honor your father and mother, even if they're wrong. It doesn't say honor your father and mother if they walk with God. See, the years of obedience may cease when you get older, but the years of honor remain. The word honor is the Greek word timao, which means to give value. It's equivalent of the Hebrew halal, which means to give honor and value. Children and even adults, God's word commands honor, value your father and mother. This is the flaw and the fault of him. In other words, he ridiculed the old man's downfall. Your parents are not perfect. None, no parent is perfect. But children have no excuse for dishonoring their parents. Because the Bible says so. It warranted the death penalty and because of this breach of domestic and filial impropriety, Ham could expect nothing less than the oracle against his own family's honor. A curse. On contrast, in verse 23, we find righteous conduct. Shem and, Ham, Shem and Japheth, the brothers of Ham, acted to preserve the honor of their father by covering him. They were cautious. Did you know the, the, the language of verse 23? Shem and Ham took a garment, laid it upon, upon both their shoulders, and went backward. You see how cautious they were to dishonor their, their father? And covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So it dramatizes the brothers' sensitivity and piety. That's a direct antithesis to Ham's behavior. Oh, children and adults, honor your father and your mother, despite their flaws. By the way, you did not choose them. God chose them over you. When you complain against your parents, you are complaining against God. When was the last time you heard a message like that? There is a generation, the book of Proverbs says, where children will not honor their parents. Romans chapter 1 describes the characteristics of a pagan society. It says they are unthankful to parents. 2 Timothy chapter 3 describes the marks of the end times, unthankful and disobedient to parents. So you are a Christian. You should honor your parents. So note the second point. We're now in our second point. God will bless the righteous but curse those who act with moral abandonment. Notice the curse that, God, that Noah gave him. Noah awoke, verse 24, from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. You say, why did God curse Canaan? Why did Noah curse Canaan when it was Ham who committed the sin? So here we have Talionic justice demanding humiliation that will follow an act of pride. Ham's act of pride or hubris was uh, retaliated or was you know, met uh, Talionic justice. Ham made an irreparable breach in his father's family and therefore a curse will be put in his own family. In the ancient times or the world, the curse was only a powerful, as powerful as the one making it. The Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, had no magical ideas such as sorcery and divination, as Exodus 22, 18. 
There's nothing magical about Noah saying, you shall be cursed. And there's nothing magical when the father says to his son or daughter, you shall be cursed. Okay. One who commits serious transgressions against them was delivered up to misfortune and the activation of which belonged to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to God. Therefore, the curse was thus a means of seeing that the will of the Lord was executed in divine judgment on anyone profaning that was sacred. It was an expression of faith in the just rule of God. For one who would curse had no other resource but to turn to God. The words had no power in themselves except the Lord himself performed them. It was thus in every sense an oracle. God himself would bring about the curse if it was indeed his desire to do so. So the question still remains, how can God punish Canaan for the sin of his father Ham? The Bible or the Mosaic law teaches that a person received punishment for his own sin, not another's. You find that in Deuteronomy 4, 6, 24, 16 and Ezekiel 18. And you have the church bulletin, you have the notes there. So how do we explain Noah cursing Ham's descendants, the Canaanites? Well, it is best to recognize that Noah's curse and blessings do not impose judgment, but they are an invocation or a prayer to the Lord. It is not a prophecy. This is shown by the language of the Hebrew text. The Hebrew verbal mood expressing a wish in the last triplet. May God enlarge. The words cursed and blessed uh, while they are in the imperative form have the force of a request. Notice the New King James rendering. Let me read the New King James rendering to you. Let me see if I can see. Okay. The New King James renders it this way. And he said, Noah said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may, may Canaan be uh, may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servants. Notice how it's rendered. It's rendered as a request or invocation or as a prayer. So, <clears throat> so in other words, we have here a request instead. <clears throat> okay, let me go back to my notes here. <clears throat> it is so. Uh, Noah's words had no magical powers that destined the fates of future generations. His appeal was to God, and whose will alone countered for what would become of the nations. But notice the second half of the, of the curse. Cursed be Canaan. He shall be the servant of servants. Noah using the superlative. That is the most abject slavery. Canaan would serve his relatives Shem and Japheth. Shem was the father of the Jewish nation. Japheth was the father of those who migrated north the Russians and etc. Okay, uh, the North Americans and the like. Ham's descendants went to down South Africa and even we are actually part of the descendants of Ham. The Torah does, does incorporate judgment from one generation to another in Exodus 25 where the later generation must be judged for the sin of an ancestor. Uh, the Torah, which shows that God deals justly with all people, suggests that Noah anticipated him, Canaan, the evil traits that marked his father Ham. And the text prepared the reader for this conclusion by twice pointing out that Ham was the father of Canaan. It was directed to his distant descendants who retained their traits. In other words, everything that Canaan did in their pagan existence after Ham passed out from the scene was symbolized by the attitude of Ham. From the moment the patriarchs entered the land, these tribes were there with their corrupting influence. The Torah warned about the wickedness of the Canaanites in terms of all that called to mind the violations of Ham. 
And because of these sins, Canaanites were defiled and were to be driven out from the land by the Israelites before the Israelites. These descendants, the Canaanites, were not cursed because of what Ham did. They were cursed because they acted as their ancestors had. And it took an oracle of the Lord to reveal and, uh, and announce this. In verses 26 and 27, we have the blessing. The blessing was given to Shem. The idea that Shem, notice the blessing was given to Shem, but he, he blessed the God of Shem. The idea is that Shem would see or ascribe his good fortune to the Lord. For his advantage would be his relationship to the Lord. It would be clear to Israel that they were the heirs of the blessing. Since they will be the ones who receive, who will read the, the Torah. As they encountered the Canaanites, they would know that the blessing subjugated the Canaanites to them. The prayer of Japheth's share in the blessing is strengthened by another wordplay in Genesis 9.27. There will be peaceful cohabitation between the Japhethites and the Shemites, or at least alliance in the subjugation of Canaan, for Japheth shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And we have here the dominant feature of this oracle, the cursing of Canaan. Canaan shall be his servant, in other words. It was a narrative immediately that precedes the table of nations of chapter 10. It was preparing the reader and introducing this was the this was Ham, the father of the Canaanites, of whom in chapter 10 you will see his descendants. And eventually in chapters 11 and 12, 11, they built the altar of the Tower of Babel in chapter 12, the reason why God calls out a man out of them, who was Abraham. <clears throat> the point is God's preparation for the giving of the land to Abraham. This point would then typify the preparation of the land for Israel's inheritance. Uh, through whom the promised seed shall come. So this was the narrative, Moses arranging his material to point to the promised land and eventually Abraham from whom the seed of the woman will be coming from and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. The lesson, God will bless the righteous but curse those who live in moral abandonment. And when will this be realized? It will be realized according to the design of the writer uh, during the period of the conquest when Israel under the leadership of Joshua will conquer the land and drive away the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites. And Israel would know and be able to trace this is where it all began. In all the event and its oracle were recorded to remind the Israelites of the, the nature and the origin of the Canaanites and warn them about such abominations and to justify their subjugation and the dispossession through holy warfare. Israel received the blessing, but the Canaanites received the curse. As we close the biblical narrative in chapter 9, we see in verse 28 and 29, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. We have here Moses reminding us, or the inspired record reminding us, of the realities of a fallen world which remain even after the global deluge because the Bible says even Noah had to die. There are, these are the only words heard from Noah in the whole narrative after the flood. They are in effect his last will and testament for the subsequent verses report of his death. Noah's obituary completes the record of Seth's descendants which traces the Sethite lineage down to Noah, and it concludes then he died. Noah holds the final 10th position in the record of the, and was vital to the genealogical, genealogical link between the old world and the world that followed after the flood. And the memory of the antediluvian era will be perpetual or perpetuated by his sons and their descendants. All of these materials being arranged as Moses was moved by the Holy Spirit to bring us to the table of nations and where the table of nations will tell us where these people who built the Tower of Babel at Shinar, an organized rebellion or religion against God and the reason why God calls out a man 
or in which the promised seed will come as Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. So these are the lessons of Genesis chapters 9, the last portion. The challenge is very clear. What about us? From the beginning of that narrative, do we honor our father and mother? Drunkenness, nakedness come together when we give in to excessive wine in order to come out with, an, with in order to break the monotony of life. These are the warnings of Scripture. We need to heed it, heed it eventually. Let me close by turning to Romans chapter 13. An exhortation Paul had to the New Testament church. Romans chapter 13. Notice verses 11 to 14. To the believer, to the born again child of God, Paul writes, verse 11, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore in the light of these truths, his coming is sooner than we think. Therefore, we need to cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Paul is using the metaphor of putting on and putting off of a garment. Now that you're alive in Christ, remove all the garments of the old life. You need to wear garments that are befitting a person who's alive in Christ. And what does it mean in specific terms? Verse 13, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness. He mentions drunkenness there, lawless living and drunkenness. Not in chambering and wantonness. These are sexual sins. Not in strife and envying. Instead, we are to what? Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And did you notice that last phrase there? He mentions drunkenness, rioting, chambering, wantonness, strife and envying. And then in verse 14, he says, Make not provision for the flesh. We say, well, Pastor, maybe, yeah, Noah's sin was drunkenness because he had too much wine. Paul knew the dangers of excessive wine. And that's why he says, drunkenness is a sin. But verse 14, he says, do not even make provision for the flesh. Don't even give in to fulfill its lusts thereof. You know sinful nature. You give in to the flesh an inch, it will ask for a foot. You give it a foot, it will ask for a meter. So don't even give in. Don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts, the Word of God says. It's one of the clearest passages that talks about total abstinence for the believer. Will you hear the challenge? Our Father in Heaven, thank you for these portions of Scripture that bring us back to history and where all things began. Thank you for these practical exhortations that we can learn lessons from the life of Noah and his ancestry, from a spiritual giant who fell into sin, showing the frailties of humanity despite their spiritual heights. So help us, Lord, to be careful in our steps, in our walk. Speak to our hearts that we will live in righteousness and true holiness to be filled with the Spirit instead of being dominated by the flesh by being drunk with wine. Heads are bowed, eyes closed, with no one looking around. I'm not going to